I see that Professor Mazur has joined us. And so without further ado, I would like to introduce our next event for the day. And this will be a, the federal court's response to COVID-19, a Q&A with Chief Judge Rebecca Hallmeyer. And also serving as a moderator for this Q&A is Professor Jonathan Mazur. Professor Mazur is the John P. Wilson Professor of Law, David and Cecilia Hillard Research Scholar, and Director of the Wachtell Lipton Rosen and Katz Program in Behavioral Law, Finance and Economics at the University of Chicago Law School. His research at the law school focuses on patent law, administrative law, behavioral law and economics, and criminal law. Thank you, Professor Mazur and Chief Judge Paul Meyer. Uh, thank you very much, Claire. Um, it is uh, my role here is, is merely to introduce uh, Chief Judge Paul Meyer and get out of the way, and I am more than happy to do that. It is my distinct pleasure and honor uh, to uh, to be uh, introducing Judge Chief Judge Paul Meyer and to be moderating this panel. Uh, Chief Judge Rebecca R. Paul Meyer got her bachelor's degree from Valparaiso, her JD from the University of Chicago Law School. Uh, after a distinguished career in the law, which included a stint uh, as a judge on the Illinois Human Rights uh, Commission, she was nominated by President Bill Clinton to serve on the Northern District of Illinois. She was confirmed in 1998, and on July 1st, 2019, she became the first woman to hold the position of Chief Judge on the Northern District of Illinois. Chief Judge Paul Meyer has long been a good friend of the law school. That included presenting a fabulous paper on uh, crime and redemption at the legal forum symposium held on the wire two years ago. Um, so she is no stranger to this event either. Um, her uh, impeccable judgment as a jurist is matched only by her impeccable judgment when it comes to television and popular culture as well. Uh, and there is no better individual to deliver this year's keynote address. So without further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming uh, the fabulous uh, Chief Judge Rebecca Palmer. All right, is that better? Okay, sorry. <laughs> you know, uh, technology is not working so well. All right, uh, it's often said that generals are always prepared to fight the last war. And so it may well be that the lessons we are learning from this pandemic are lessons that would have been very useful to us a year ago, but will not be that helpful when we face the next crisis, one that may be markedly different from this one. I'm no futurist. To the contrary, I am largely suspicious of confident predictions and am instead a firm believer in the law of unintended consequences. But with all of that said, if there is a pandemic that is at all similar to COVID-19, I think the experiences of 2020 will be illuminating. I can't speak for all of the institutions that have responded to this virus or even all the legal institutions that have faced the challenge, but I can examine the impact that COVID-19 has had on the large urban trial court where I am chief judge. The first lesson our court has learned is humility. The court cannot seamlessly change the way it operates. Our court's culture assumes a lot of face time. In this court, we're accustomed to lawyers in the courtroom every day. In addition to lawyers, we expect to see parties, witnesses, jurors, family members, curious spectators, and the press. We conduct ceremonies of all kinds, and we, we swear in new citizens in large groups. Courts have a responsibility for civic education, so we see and speak to school groups and bar associations regularly as well. The pandemic brought a sharp haul to all of those activities. When COVID forced the sudden closure of the Chicago Public Schools, we realized that everything had to change. In the immediate wake of the virus, courts ceased operations completely. We did not do that, and indeed it is a principle that the federal courts never close. Our own court activated what is known as its COOP plan, C-O-O-P, standing for continuing operations, an emergency plan that essentially sends every, nearly everybody home, but continues court activity as possible and necessary. We reduced our in-court staff to a handful of judges. I was one of the lucky winners. I was in here frequently and a single clerk and ruling on all of the motions was performed presented only after telephonic or video conference hearings. In the months that followed, we expanded our activity slightly and brought other judges back on, semi in court and semi remote working, working basis, but we have largely limited our hearings. We were able to conduct a few civil and criminal trials, but as of a few weeks ago, 
with COVID numbers in the state soaring, as of a week ago, actually, with, with COVID numbers in our state soaring, we are now back on a more restricted program. I can describe to you what it was like to conduct jury trials during this uh, era, if we have a chance during the question and answer period. Our efforts to move to a digital screen world have been halting and very unsatisfying in many ways. Video conferencing platforms don't always work smoothly. I mean, what just happened a moment ago is an indication. We judges who revel in the pomp and pageantry of the courtroom find ourselves instead peering into small screens, feeling more like bureaucrats than judicial officers, often embarrassed and awkward about our own limited skills or our inadequate technical support. Participants in the process, the parties, lawyers, and the public have difficulty connecting and are themselves uncomfortable with the process. Those of us who function in the court systems are acutely aware of the importance of a vibrant and functioning legal world. The federal courts really truly never do close and the public needs to have faith in the judiciary in challenging times. We need to be able to resolve disputes quickly and provide guidance that may not be perfect, but enables societal functions. And as important as all of this is, we also recognize that what the world most needs now is something the courts cannot provide, a vaccine. What we can do is carry out the role of the courts to bring repose and resolve disputes. In the last even several hours, all of us have seen the courts in action, resolving issues that have popped up in this post-election era. This is what the courts have done for generations. And really for generations, we've done our work in much the same way. Courtrooms built in the 20th century look structurally the way they did in earlier times. A bench in front, a witness box, seats for court staff, a podium or podiums for the lawyers, a jury box, benches for spectators and witnesses. Today, courtrooms also feature screens and microphones, but the process remains very similar to what took place decades ago and continues to function reasonably well. The practice itself continues to follow familiar traditions. Lawyers prepare and file briefs, at one time only in hard copy, and good writing has always been and remains the central skill for good attorneys. There's also always been a significant tradition of oral advocacy. The back and forth of argument with lawyers face to expressive face is stimulating and valuable. A trial, even one that addresses very dry or technical issues is absorbing. Surely this was true when Clarence Darrow appeared in our federal court. And to this day, observing a great a cross examination or closing argument is compelling drama. My knees still shake when a jury walks back into the courtroom with a verdict. But practice in the courts has seen significant changes, and those changes began well before COVID-19. I've already mentioned the presence of screens in the courtrooms. Chambers look different, too. Walls of built-in bookshelves are now as likely to feature a judge's baseball hat collection as it does volumes of the federal supplement. In fact, the wall you see right behind me was is a wall. But when I moved into this chambers about a little bit more than a year ago, that wall was solid bookshelves and I had them taken out for the obvious reason. We read case law on a screen and most of us read our briefs on a screen as well. Though not all state courts are quite there yet, federal courts have long since abandoned federal uh, paper trials, files. Until recently, many judges nevertheless relied on lawyers to give us what is called courtesy copies, printouts of their filings. That practice, which involved messengers or other staff entering the courthouse at all hours of the day to make deliveries, has come to an end, almost certainly a permanent end. It didn't make sense even before the pandemic, but today, the fewer people set foot in the courthouse, the safer we all are. Our large and posing courthouses stand very empty today, and this emptiness will be desirable in the event of any other contagious virus. The courts are disposing of cases and motions in somewhat different ways than we did before the pandemic. We have dispensed with much of the formality. A year ago, I might have waited until lawyers appeared in court to present a motion, even one that's fairly routine. It was useful for me to see the lawyers in action, learn about and potentially resolve a, dis a discovery dispute right on the spot or set the pretrial schedule. In an era when my prior priority is keeping people out of the courthouse, the practice is different. When there's a rather obvious result of a particular motion, I may issue a ruling in a perfunctory way, counting on opposing counsel to let me know if, I, if it should be revisited. 
The safety and economy of this approach compensates at least to some degree for the loss of direct interaction with lawyers. Things may well return to a bit more traditional practice when the pandemic is over, but our ability to move nimbly to rulings on a paper record will serve us well in the event of another such disaster. In fact, I can predict with mixed feelings that a remote practice is likely to continue. We are doing more than reading print on our screens. Here, the pandemic has significantly accelerated the pace of change. Just as in law schools, in the academy generally, and in business, we in the courts have moved rapidly away from live hearings to remote arguments and hearings. There is a sterility about this and a loneliness, but the advantages are obvious too and are not limited to the fact that nobody is infected through a computer screen. Nobody needs to travel from home in order to participate in an online hearing. There's little need for quote, professional clothing or even shoes. Some persons with disabilities find this new way of proceeding to be a great leveler. The clerk of our federal court here came up with a plan to enable defense counsel to communicate with detained defendants using computer tablets in our local jails at a very large cost savings. The hearings themselves are different, not always in a bad way. In some ways, it is easier to observe facial expressions when we are all in close-ups. Getting dressed for work or even a social event is easy, and commuting is a breeze. We never have that awkward sensation of realizing we've been introduced to somebody but can no longer remember that person's name. It's right there on the screen. A judge with hearing disabilities can turn up the volume or rely on the court reporter real-time feed to catch nearly every word. The courts have made a somewhat halting but also headlong dive into remote proceedings. Our facility with these processes will certainly serve us in the next pandemic. The process of pretrial discovery is another one that saw rapid change in recent times and even more significant change as a result of the pandemic. The production of documents called for by Rule 36 was once largely a paper process. Today, of course, documents are produced and exchanged electronically. And the parties devote substantial effort to developing a protocol for production and review of electronically stored information. Until recently, however, most deposition discovery could be expected to take place live, even in situations where the witness was being videotaped. The COVID-19 pandemic appears to have completed the process of changing that expectation. In some instances, disagreement about the need for in-person deposition testimony reaches the courts. Some opinions that have been issued as recently as last week will demonstrate that. But in most cases, the lawyers seem to work out a resolution and decide that a deponent on a screen may not be the most desirable, but it's good enough. In fact, this method of conducting our business is likely to flourish with or without another pandemic. But there are some disadvantages to it. I have several times heard from litigants for whom the video conference process is invasive. They feel uncomfortable that others can see their homes their furniture and their clutter, sometimes their children or even their pets. Some lawyers lack technical skills or bandwidth, or they're sharing an internet con connection with other family members. As an institution, courts will need to address the intrusiveness of video conferencing and the issue of access. Another appealing aspect of life on a screen is the ease of tuning out. All of us have been there. Things are slow or boring and we check our email or we do an online crossword puzzle or we return to another project. We can mute ourselves and we can replace our image with an avatar, one that often looks a whole lot better than we're looking that day. And we can wander into the kitchen for a cup of coffee. A speaker on a video conference call is deprived of the body language and physical cues that enable the speaker to adjust the presentation or try a different tack. And that means that those of you who've already tuned out I don't know, and there's no way I can reach you until you tune back in. Most significant for me is the video conference, quote, environment. When a visitor steps into a church or temple or mosque, the visitor has a sense of the sacred feeling that is intended and without being coached, lowers the voice. Walk into Wrigley Field or a coffee shop or a classroom, and the behavioral norms there are obvious as well. A courtroom has that same effect. Our courtrooms are large and imposing and somber and serious. We judges wear robes and are seated at an elevated remove from the litigants. We are the quiet and commanding presence in a setting of dignity. Much of that feeling evaporates on a video screen. Lawyers generally understand the process and play by the rules, but our participants are not all lawyers. 
And persons who are not familiar with the system and are not socialized lack access to the cues that the courtroom itself communicates. I confess to rampant ego here. Walking into a courtroom in a black robe and taking a seat at the bench is a huge rush. It's also a sobering and centering experience and it's one I miss. Another pandemic might make that experience even more rare. If that experience influences and improves the performance of judges and heightens respect among litigants, if that experience of being in the courthouse makes a difference, then its loss is a sad one. The courts will need to find ways to create a sense of decorum for people who may never set foot inside a courthouse. It's no secret that the number of jury trials has declined over time and COVID-19 has accelerated that decline as well. Only recently, our court suspended jury trials for a second time since this pandemic began. Though the number of jury trials has declined, there has been no real decline in the number of civil or criminal cases filed. Indeed, in our court, the criminal case filings have ticked upward. Most civil cases are resolved without trial, either by way of dismissal or summary judgment ruling or by settlement. And we can conduct our bench trials with little difficulty. Another pandemic, one involving easy transmission of a virus, will likely make jury trials even more rare. The absence of jurors from our courthouses for lengthy periods of time can have profound effect. The Constitution guarantees the right to a jury trial in felony cases and in many civil cases. Most defendants facing criminal charges do want a jury trial, believing, as they do, that their odds are improved when the prosecution is required to convince 12 persons, not just one, of guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Civil litigants are equally passionate. Most individual plaintiffs who believe they have been wronged also believe their story will be persuasive to a group of their fellow citizens. We trial judges love jury trials as well. Picking a jury can be a challenge. In a case involving ugly facts or technical complications or one that will consume several days, potential jurors are often reluctant or apprehensive or resentful. But things nearly always change during the course of jury selection. Jurors come to recognize the importance of their own role in a jury trial. They recognize that they are capable of that important work. And the idea that somebody might think otherwise becomes vaguely insulting to them. Jurors who are chosen and seated in the box seem to respond physically, sitting up straighter, paying more attention. As lawyers who've conducted trials learn, often to their chagrin, the jurors see and hear everything. The jury deliberation process is genuinely inspiring. I can think of no process like it in American life. The 12 jurors nearly always have very little in common. They come from across the political spectrum. They are evangelical Christians and observant Muslims and atheists, gun rights advocates and the reverse, persons with PhDs, high school dropouts, business executives and struggling artists. Yet they spend hours or days listening to evidence and then sit by themselves in a small room to talk about what they heard. Despite these massive differences, jurors nearly always reach a decision that they can all live with. They walk back into the courtroom as a team, led by the foreperson who has the verdict in his hand or her hand. Jurors do not always enjoy the process, but so very often they develop a respect for it. They come away with it, come away from it with an understanding of the procedures and even the reasons for them. Some of them even appear to have learned the rules of evidence. Having invested their own time in the trial process, jurors come to believe that if not perfect, the process is a fair one. The importance of this cannot be overstated from a remarkable absence of civic education and understanding. Lawyers are the target of suspicion and cynicism, and judges can be as well. The third branch of government functions only well, well only on the strength of the nation's respect for it. The involvement of jurors in reaching decisions is a key component in promoting that respect. If this pandemic or the next one makes jury trials even an even more rare feature of our jurisprudence, the courts as an institution will need to fill the gap in public education in a way that requires them to abandon the convenient detachment that many judges treasure. Courthouses without jurors, juries are much quieter places. When hearings take place only on video screens, we can be flexible about where and how these things happen. 
As this pandemic or the next one pushes us farther into that direction, it will also push us farther in the direction of flexibility with work locations and working hours for our staffs. The change is notable in my own chambers. We are physically in the courthouse only about half of the time, and even then, I see my own law clerks and my assistant for just a few moments each day. I don't go to lunch or out, out for colleague with my co coffee with my colleagues or my staff. I've always personally been flexible about work hours, but now it matters even less when people are doing their work so long as it gets done. Flexibility about work hours should be a positive thing for lawyers. First, flexibility may mean doing less. For far too long, the practice of billing clients on an hourly basis for legal work has created perverse incentives. Lawyers are rewarded for devoting hours and days of time to projects for which they can then invoice the very people to whom they owe fiduciary duties. If the pandemic pushes the law in a different direction with respect to billing patterns or work expectations, this will be welcome fallout. Young lawyers and high-end firms nearly always tell me they would gratefully trade more time for a portion of their large salaries. In a COVID-19 era, we will look, have to look unfavorably on people who refuse to take time off for illness. Flexibility may also mean that there are no limits to when or where the work is done. This too could be a positive change and certainly one the judiciary would embrace in the event of another pandemic. Lawyers and staff need not commute to the office every day or even any day. With a reliable Wi-Fi connection, effective work and instant communication is possible regardless of where we are living. Some evidence suggests an effect on living pattern already. That is, people are moving from city locations to suburbs or even out of state. If commuting is not a daily occurrence, then living close to the office or close to public transportation may be less necessary or even desirable. The courts, like other legal institutions, will need to be able to function nimbly, relying on staff who are always available to work online, but not at all available to be physically present in the workplace. The result of flexibility may also be that work hours are 24 seven and there's no freedom from the phone and email. School systems across the nation have developed remote or at least partially remote class schedules. I understand children in Minnesota are aggrieved by this. They recognize that if the school district can direct on any given day that classes take place remotely, there may never again be another slow snow day. So too in the legal practice, it may be that because nobody needs to come to the office to work, they're expected to be working all the time, whether, whether they're in the office or not. That kind of quote flexibility serves no employee well and will have particularly harsh operation on parents who serve primary roles, very often women. The courts do not control what happens in private law practice, but the courts and all legal employers must recognize and make room for circumstances that interfere with standard expectations. When schools close suddenly, parents are not able to work as quickly or as effectively. The pandemic has had significant effects on the operations of the judiciary. Our large courthouses stand largely empty, but that does not mean they are no longer necessary. We do firmly expect to conduct trials in the future. For now, the need for social distancing confirms the requirement of the additional space. Working remotely changes the dynamic in the courthouse. Before closing, let me spend a few minutes on the potpourri of effects that the challenges we are facing will have, I believe, on litigation and law practice. For young lawyers, a very significant one relates to the social world. There is a process of socialization in any profession, and of course that is true in the law. Young lawyers make friends with one another observe patterns of behavior on the part of more experienced colleagues, have the opportunity to recognize and choose the types of life they want to lead. They chat over coffee in law office corridors or grab a drink together after work. Practicing law from a kitchen table or a bedroom works, but it carves out aspects of professional life in large and subtle ways. Bar associations and inns of court are struggling to attract members, even though in some ways those organizations are needed more than ever. New lawyers are more, will need to be more imaginative than we are, and they will need to make an effort to learn the norms of this profession in very different ways. A pandemic will change other procedures. We've seen a sea change in the way people vote in the United States. This is something that's very salient this week. This year, there have been record numbers of mail-in ballots, and I myself voted early for the first time in my life. An election-related issue that came before me recently 
uh, involved the practice in Illinois of requiring candidates for many offices to collect signatures on nominating pe petitions. Suddenly in March, when the activity traditionally gets underway, nobody was going anywhere. And the idea of standing outside a grocery store, thrusting a petition into, into the hands of a would-be shopper became unthinkable. What power does the court have, if any, to change the petition requirement? The pandemic has challenged me to brush up on things I learned about in law school, but haven't thought about once since. For example, force majeure, the doctrine that essentially frees both parties from liability or obligation when an extraordinary event or a circumstance beyond the control such as of the of parties occurs, such as a war, a strike, or an act of God. Does a pandemic count? We're finding out. I expect there will be some changes in the law itself. Consider the doctrine of forum non-convenience. Essentially under that doctrine, we consider motions to transfer a case from one district court to another for the quote, convenience of parties and witnesses. For at least 10 years, maybe more, that doctrine has made very little sense. Parties and witnesses aren't coming to court at all. Now they're all on screens. With a minor issue of time zones, a party can effectively participate in court proceedings and in discovery from pretty much anywhere in the world. Absent a forum selection clause, I would expect the transfers from one district to another will become very rare indeed. Let's consider jurisdictional questions. We still get motions to dismiss for lack of personal jurisdiction. Plenty of money and time are thrown at the question of whether a person or business has, quote, availed themselves of the state's protections or had purposely directed his or her activity toward the state's residents. In a world where so much happens in the cloud, what does that mean? What internet activity counts? The confrontation clause of the Sixth Amendment is bedrock constitutional doctrine. In an era when so much evidence is gathered by a video or phone pings, what does it mean to be truly confronted by a witness? With respect to witness testimony, are there circumstances in which the right of confrontation is satisfied even when a witness is heard by a remote platform? These are issues we have not addressed before, and there are others as well free speech issues, religious discrimination issues, balancing of the safety of detainees against safety of the community, balancing legitimate expressive activity against the need for order. These challenges will be, be with us for months and years to come. If we think of these challenges as part of the war on COVID and that another pandemic may lie in the future, well, generals are always prepared to fight the last war. But preparing to fight the last war is not necessarily a foolish thing to do. If military technology is stable, the lessons of the last war probably retain their authority, and so too the legal system. Let me end my remarks with words from Mayor Harold Washington. This is what he said in his inaugural address in 1983, and I believe it is still true today. Most of our problems can be solved. Some of them will take brains, some of them will take patience and all of them will have to be wrestled with like an alligator in the swamp. I'm looking forward to having many of you future lawyers fighting the alligators in the swamp with me. And I'd be happy to take your questions now. I think there's one online already here. Thank you so much, Chief Judge Palmer. Sure, if you'd like to answer Alex Short's question to start, and then if other students would like to, or anyone else would like to raise their hands, their blue hands, uh, I can call them for that, but please Great. go ahead. Great. Um, do I think that actual virtual hearings need some changes? Example, new legal proceed, proceedings or new hardware or the problems you talked about could get resolved after people get used to this technology. You know, I think it's mixed. Uh, the technological challenges are huge. Um, the, as I indicated, it, it isn't just the courts that have to get used to this. The lawyers are not always up to speed and, and bandwidth issues are huge. Uh, we in, in our court here do not use Zoom Zoom is terrific. We can see that it's terrific, but we don't use Zoom because it's not supported by the, by the uh, Administrative Office of U.S. Courts. So we use other video platforms that either work differently or are unfamiliar to people, and, and it's just rocky. Um, I think all of the platforms are improving, and I think market forces are great in this respect. So, for example, we can all now do you know, virtual backgrounds. We can, just, we can share things on our screen. Earlier today, I saw the entire you know, the, the PowerPoints that the other speakers had prepared it was very useful. We can we can put in a, a video if we if we need to do that. In some ways, it's easier to highlight exhibits and 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 show them show them to one another. Last week, I conducted a claims construction hearing, and uh, Professor Mazur will know what that is. But essentially, this is a 
a hearing at which uh, a patentee, a person with a patent, argues about what the meanings of various phrases in the patent might mean, and the alleged infringer argues for the contrary, and the court makes a decision just as the court would in the question of, in the case of what does a contract mean, make a decision about what the language of the, um, of the patent means. And I thought the video platform was perfect for that because not only could we look at one another's PowerPoints online, but we could examine um, direct applications from the patents into, into the real world about you know, the, the kind of technology and how it works. So I think there are some, some pluses. I think they will improve. There are some things that I think will be will never be quite as good as 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 live. And one of the things I mentioned really is the whole atmosphere issue, the sense that the sense of importance of what we're doing and 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 perhaps there are ways to make that happen more effectively on a screen, but we're not there yet. Okay, great. Um the first person I see in the queue. Hi, uh, Chief Judge Palmer. Thank you for coming. Thank you for speaking. Um, I had a quick question. You kind of talked about this earlier, but I wanted to like a more direct answer on this question. Um, you know, obviously Zoom and these teleconferencing um, technology increases access to uh, the legal system. Yeah, right. How are judges uh, and courts thinking about literally uh, expanding access to the justice system? And in particular, um, using this as possibly as a means of restoring faith uh, in the justice system for those who come from marginalized communities. For instance, um, has there been any thought or consideration of, um, you know, creating formal, informal, I mean, technically informal um, courtrooms, like in the south side of Chicago, you know, any, like any couple of blocks away from us, which are far from the actual courtroom, but which might uh, increase presence and in increase access to the justice system and increase trust in it and increase belief in it, you know, like, how are we thinking about using this as a means to really reach out to people who don't have any formal connection to the legal system besides negative ones? Well, in, in all the ways that you that you just described, we this morning I conducted a sentencing um, via video, and the the spouse of the individual I was sentenced was able to participate in part because the spouse was able to get a video connection and 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 sit in in spite of the fact that that the spouse was not here physically. So we're doing that already. Note that uh, you're you're right that there there are tremendous possibilities for marginalized communities to have connections with the court that they might not have had. We are. Um, we are also sensitive to the fact that Wi-Fi reach is, has, has been challenging in, uh, in minority communities, in, in disadvantaged communities. We, we are finding, for example, that in some communities, it's much more likely that people can connect using a smartphone than that they would, that they would connect using you know, a screen such as the one I'm using right now. So we are, are definitely sensitive to that and we're thinking about ways that we can reach out to people whose Wi-Fi connection is not as smooth, not as effective, or that, we're, that, that it's limited to a telephone. Um, I know the Illinois, Illinois courts recently uh, approved a, pra a practice of actually jury selection via video. And we talked about that. And we were talking about that here in our court. We're very concerned that that might exacerbate a problem we already have, many courts have, of underrepresentation of disadvantaged uh, populations on our juries, and and a jury of peers means a jury from every imaginable neighborhood, and we really don't want to eliminate that. But you're right that this is a we should look at this in exactly the way you're suggesting as an opportunity and not um, and, and not a disadvantage. This is like so many fields, the the, the pandemic uh, the pandemic has pushed us in a direction that we were maybe moving towards slowly anyway. And now we've kind of leapfrogged over that gradual process and have, have been thrust into using screens in a way we never did before. But we do need to think seriously about how can this actually be an advantage. And I think to some degree it has been already. Again, particularly in criminal cases, we have, um, uh, let me give you one other example. We have uh, in our court, we are, are detainees, people who are arrested, have, have been not released on a bond, are typically held in the Metropolitan Correctional Center, which is I can see it from my window here. Um, but we also have a number of detainees in far-flung county jails in Kankakee, in Kendall County, in Livingston County. Um, these are these are in Winnebago County. These are, are significant distances. And when we have lawyers that represent those individuals, getting getting those having those lawyers drive all the way out to a far-flung facility only to learn that there's a, you know, a shutdown or there's a lockdown and they can't get in. 
is is really a, an extraordinary waste of, of time. So we have we have been able almost from the beginning to put in a mechanism for people to communicate via FaceTime with their lawyers, even from these uh, these detention facilities. So yes, it, it, it's you're, you're exactly right that we need to think about this as a way to enable us to reach people who who's, who had difficulties. Another area like that. Our, our courts are, you know, especially as they're as they're rehabbed and rebuilt, much more um, uh, much more welcoming to persons with disabilities. But the reality is, getting on a city bus or a train to come downtown, with or with or or finding a parking spot in downtown Chicago, is challenging for people with physical disabilities. the uh, The ability to to connect by a screen makes a big difference. Great, um, Claire. Hi, Chief Judge Paulmeyer. Um, building on your, your comment that you're considering jury selection virtually, do you think that there's a place for a virtual component of jury trials if in-person jury trials need to be suspended for a significant amount of time? I, I struggle with the idea of a virtual jury because I think the process of jury deliberation is and maybe this is a function of, of the fact that I'm, I'm not a person of great imagination, but I think the jury selection, the jury deliberation process, sitting in a room together without anybody's smartphones going off, without the ability, you know, to, uh, for example, tune out is, is, is so significant. You know, we, when we instruct our juries, one of the things we tell them is, and, and I've actually enforced something like this, that if, you know, when, the, when, the, when one of the jurors needs for example, to leave the building for a smoke break, or one of the when one of the jurors goes to the bathroom, or when they when they when somebody is breaking for lunch, they have to stop deliberating because it has to be all of them all at the same time, and they can police each other. I don't know how easy it is to do that on a screen. I I, I just don't know. I mean, even right now, I mean, the reality is I'm paying attention to just you, but you don't know that I couldn't maybe have a you know, phone thing going on or, you know, again, doing something on the side, that happens. And that isn't the way, it, at least it's not the way we've traditionally done it. Is it possible? Yes. I don't want to ever select a jury in, in a way that makes, that exacerbates our problems of represent, representative juries. But yes, I, I, you know, we'll consider, we'll at least consider any alternative that will make it possible, whether that would include deliberations, I think very unlikely. Hi, um, I have two questions for you. I think there might be in different spheres, but the first question is um, what you were piggybacking on what you're talking about with um, EJ, that um, about how lawyers getting in touch with their clients. Have you found that it's more difficult for defendants to have access to counsel now because of the pandemic? And further, um, are you seeing because of the difficulties, anybody raising claims of ineffective assistance of counsel? And then my second question would be is how has the pandemic affected how you've handled bail or sentencing? Okay, um, starting with the first question. Yes, of course, it makes it difficult for people to meet with their, with their clients. Um, I haven't seen ineffective assistance claims. Those usually come up in a you know, post-conviction proceeding and by way of a, a habeas petition. But that said, I do have, have heard complaints from defendants who have not seen their lawyer as frequently or as effectively as they want to. It's, it's, definitely, it's definitely a concern. Um, we do, in our local detention facilities, not only have the mechanism of using FaceTime, but, but they can visit there too. That, that, that hasn't gone away completely. Um, and with respect to your, your second question about how do we handle bail issues, what we have been doing, we, in some instances, we are having live hearings. I'm not suggesting that they aren't have, happening at all. It, I, I would say that we do have live hearings here frequently. And let me just, you know, confirm something I've said in many instances, which is bench trials are not a problem. We, we have very large courtrooms and you could easily socially distance effectively during a bench trial. The problem is juries sitting near one another. That's the challenge. And we actually re-engineered my courtroom. I'm pointing this way because that's where my courtroom is. We, we pulled out a bunch of the benches and, 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 and moved seats in so that we can put a jury in there all separated from one another. But there's still obviously a problem um, in jury trials. Bench trials, not as much. A hearing for bond, not a huge problem. We can have people come in. Um, but what we have done is we've, we've um, conducted hearings remotely Generally, because under the CARES Act passed by Congress earlier this year, we can do that with the consent of the defendant. And 
it works reasonably well. And one of the reasons that the defendants are surprisingly, in some cases, willing to, to go along with that procedure is they themselves, you know, it, it, much has been said and, and, and there's much concern about, about uh, exposure to COVID within detention facilities and prisons. And it's, it's a huge problem. Let me not suggest otherwise. Right now we're doing quite well in our detention facilities, but when people leave the facility and come back, they have to be quarantined because the reality is there's a lot of COVID outside the institution too, where there's no limits on who and where those people might be in contact with. So many times the, the, uh, the detainees themselves are willing to proceed by way of video conferencing because they themselves feel safer that way. So again, we always ask for their consent. We hear evidence by way of video conference or telephone. And I myself have had hearings where I've released people on bond or detained people on bond after only an electronic hearing. It, it, it's not perfect. It isn't ideal, not at all, but it does work and it's safe. Uh, Judith. Hi, I uh, think Judge Paul Meyer, thank you so much for um, coming and speaking. Um, I'm wondering about the, the public's right of access to the, to the court, um, not just as I'm sure you know that public right of access is not just for jury trials, but for hearings through pretrial hearings throughout the criminal process. Correct. Um, and I'm curious what you think of, um, I suppose how, how you're thinking about the public's right of access right now um, and what you whether you think um, video screens satisfy that public right of access. I mean, I, I realize that not all hearings are being conducted by video screen, but but in some cases they are. Well, it, it's complicated because under the Federal Judicial Conference rules, we're not permitted to broadcast. And to some extent, there's a sense that, you know, putting everything out on a video screen is kind of broadcasting. But let me let me say that we do, we're very sensitive to the requirement of public access. And, and, and I will assure you that if I forgot about it for five minutes, the Chicago Tribune would be letting me know. I, you know, we, we hear from the press instantly when they feel they have been excluded. You know, our, it, it, our, our court has, we, we have a, a press room in the building. We, you know, we have, we have press here in the building. Um, and again, they, they let us know instantly when we, when we have, have stepped over their, their rights. But the reality is we never closed the door to the public ever, not even during the period I told you about when only four judges were coming to court at all. Even then, if, they, if we were having a hearing in the courtroom, and people wanted to observe it, they could come. Same with respect to the, if we were doing things by video and somebody wanted to be part of it, we would arrange for a, for a hookup or a connection. We would always arrange for the press to be able to call in and hear everything. And when we are doing hearings that are somewhat remote, for example, some witnesses in the courtroom, some on a screen, we put a large screen in the courtroom and any member of the press or public that wants to observe that can come into the courtroom and observe it. Or if, if social distancing is an issue, we always have an overflow courtroom with a screen in there so that people do have that access. You know, the, 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 the pushback we've gotten from the press has basically been that they want, you know, they want to be things to be easier for them than, it, than they are for the rest of the public. And my reaction always is, you know, if a family member can't get in here, if a family member has difficulty, that's one thing. That's something I'm going to address. You yourselves, you always are free to come in. And, and, and the fact that you'd prefer to sit home and, and, and not do that, that's not my problem. OK, the queue is open. Do we have other questions? Maybe I'll take this opportunity to ask a question myself, uh, Chief Judge Palmer. Um, I, I was curious, sort of from a kind of organizational standpoint, um, and you know, in your in your role of, as as Chief Judge of the District, um, what was it like uh, working with your colleagues to get them to uh, sort of adapt to these new changes? Were people very receptive to the new technologies and sort of eager to embrace them, or were there people who were reluctant to make the move away from the usual sort of in-person proceedings? And, and then relatedly, how much of what you're doing has been sort of um, guided or dict has been guided or dictated by the administrative office of the US courts and how much of it is sort of specific to the Northern District or specific to the Dirksen building or sort of a matter of decisions that you and your colleagues have made yourselves? Well, I'll begin with that second question. It's, we, we really are, this is something I think the second largest, I mean, the largest federal court building in the nation and one of the second, maybe the second largest court. 
Um, and we have, we meet the federal district, chief district judges meet as in a group from time to time, not of course during COVID, it's all electronic now, but um, the chief judges of the large urban courts meet and we exchange, you know, the views and, and we're, I, I don't want to, you know, overstate this, but we're more or less the, we, we are leading this because we're kind of having to, to develop the, the protocols. The AO has been supportive, but no, they're not, you know, they're not, they're more companions or even followers than leaders on this. We're kind of having to kind of come up with some resolutions on our own. With respect to how receptive my colleagues have been to it, a very interesting question. Um, you know, federal district courts are large groups of people, in some cases are small groups of people, and there's a different character or personality in every court. Our court has been, as I said, one that is traditionally very strong on FaceTime with lawyers. We're, we're, in court, we're known for this. We're known for you file a motion on a Monday and you want a judge to hear that motion. You'll get in on Wednesday and get a ruling from the judge. We're known for that. In other courts, it's much more done, had traditionally much more been done on paper, and that's a, a thing we're moving to. Another difference from court to court is the collegiality of the, of the judges. And I have to say with, you know, with pretty significant confidence. This is, I think, one of the most collegial courts. We really are friends with one another. And I don't mean social friends. We're really not social friends so much. But there's a, a sense of team teamsmanship, a team teamwork and cooperation such that when something comes up and you send out a message, you know, I need help with this or that, you immediately get a response. Yeah, I can do it. I can help you. The judges are, of course, of mixed experience with respect to technology. The more senior judges, don't like it at all. A couple of the judges never even, you know, turn on a computer. They just rely on staff to do everything, which is weird. Others of us, and it's not necessarily age. I'm, a, I'm obviously one of the most se more senior judges, or I wouldn't be the chief. But um, I'm as facile with technology as anybody. I'm one who's always reading things on online and very rarely looking at a, at hard copy. But there are judges that feel differently. I didn't have too much kicking and screaming from the judges, but I do get what I get is. Um, a variety in a variety of levels of recognition of the significance of we got to do everything remotely. Some think, well, you know, it's really not that big of a problem. Just as you've seen across the nation, people view COVID very differently. Some think it's, you know, just the flu and others recognize it as I do as a pretty serious virus. So people do feel a little differently. Although in our court, we've been, we've been pretty effective at standardizing and saying, you know, most things we do are going to be electronic. Don't get here if you, you don't come in if you, um, unless we tell you you can, or in a case of a criminal case, you don't waive that right. There, you know, I'd say the, the criminal defendants are in the driver's seat on this. Um, and in general, we will do things on paper or by phone whenever we can. I, I've gotten pretty good cooperation. My, my, my colleagues are, you know, judges are, are pretty, pretty much go along with the system people. They're, they're not usually rebels. <laughs> Great, thank you. Hi, Judge Paul Meyer. Uh, thank you for coming and speaking to us. Uh, my question is about to what extent uh, changes uh, that state courts are making uh, might end up affecting federal courts through Erie Doctrine, whether uh, various re state responses uh, to the pandemic might end up implicating a substantive right uh, and therefore force federal courts to change how they handle trials or like conversely, if uh, the lack of state response to pandemic and the state's just not taking it very seriously uh, might, uh, might in some way force the federal courts to take actions that they might consider unwise given the ongoing pandemic. We, uh, with respect to Erie, of course, you know, procedural matters are determined by the federal courts and we are not we are not moved to any great degree by what by what the state courts are doing. I, you know, I, we we observe them. We're certainly their colleagues, but we're we're really not guided so much by that. For example, the issue of jury selection by video. You know, we heard about that and thought, well, you know, that's that's nice, but we immediately saw, I think, pretty immediately saw that that is not going to give us a representative jury. We're going to have pe the people that have no problem with with internet access fine, it's fine for them. And the people who are more challenged by the internet, uh, including not only because their, their Wi-Fi coverage is poor or they're, you know, they're elderly or they are of modest income or for whatever reason, it's, it's just not as convenient for them. Uh, that's, that's, that would be an issue for us that we would not be following the state court's lead. 
um, with respect to whether or not we would be pushed or we would we would have uh, be pushed to you know change our behavior because of something that the state courts do. I think only with respect to issues of substantive law, I, I, I recognize that, you know, an issue that we have that, you know, sort of relates to this question is that pretty much every, um, many, many courts, as I say, are using Zoom and that works very well and, and lawyers will assume we are as well. And as I explained, we're not. So that, that you know, the technological differences are, are challenging, but I, I would say we, you know, judges, uh, federal judges feel pretty strongly about the supremacy clause and that, you know, we're not going to do things just because the state courts do. I say that with great recognition and, and respect for a lot of my colleagues over there, but um, I, I don't think that they have a lot of influence on us. We're much more likely to be influenced by other federal courts. So I might want to find out what's happening in Philadelphia or what's happening in Los Angeles. And I'd be in touch with those people and, you know, how are they handling various problems? Great. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Question, but is unable to raise her hand because she's okay. a COVID. So why don't you go ahead? Thank you for Professor Mazur um, for moderating and thank you Chief Judge Paul Meyer for speaking with us. I found it extremely fascinating. Um, my question was related to like the sort of the substantive claims coming through the courthouse doors and if you've seen a lot of claims related to COVID itself and if those claims center on a particular area of law. Uh, have a good question. And, and yes, the answer is yes, we definitely have. Um, we, uh, let me just give you a couple of examples. First, when we, when we first closed down and we had this emergency process in place, we got, I mentioned a couple of election related cases that I got, uh, you know, nominating petitions. There was a, a case involving the, the process of putting a referendum on the Illinois ballot and whether or not collecting signatures was a reasonable requirement for that purpose. We also had uh, a couple of instances in which people uh, a major case filed against uh, the state of Illinois and a con prison conditions case that was directly COVID related in that the inmates uh, challenged uh, very effectively uh, regulations in the prison and said they weren't being permitted to socially distance, they weren't being provided with appropriate sanitation, et cetera. Same thing in, in Cook County Jail, we had um, a, a case involving um, the, the, the conditions in, in Cook County Jail as well. Um, there have been some, a number of COVID related cases arising in the business world and most significantly um, business interruption clauses in commercial contract, insurance contracts. So we have, for example, a, a restaurant that because of COVID has, has had to close or has had to drastically limit in, in, in person dining or whose business just because, you know, putting, putting, um, state regulation or state dictates aside, people just weren't going to the re going to restaurants, whether or not Governor Pritzker told us it was a good idea, people just were not going. And so there would be insurance claims made. And we now have a number of those cases in our court to the point where there's an MDL, a multi-district litigation has been filed. Um, one of our, actually one of my colleagues is on the multi-district litigation panel. And that's a group that considers requests to bring under one judge all pretrial supervision of a particular type of dispute. And in this case, all the cases involving a particular insurance contract will be decided, the pretrial matters decided by one judge here. And that is a very large issue, whether or not the business interruption clause, uh, a clause of, a, of an insurance contract is triggered by COVID. And of course, there are exclusions written into the contracts and how you interpret that language. It's, it's great fodder for, for lawyers. Um, we, we will have undoubtedly other ones. And here's another example, just as long as I'm thinking about it. The, you'll recall the PPP, the PPP money that was distributed to um, businesses in the middle of the summer to keep, make sure that they could keep their payrolls in, in place. Well, without before before too long, we had lawsuits filed by employees who said, my employer got the money, I didn't get paid, or my employer got the money and is now using it for a purpose for which it wasn't intended under the statute, and I'm a whistleblower and that's why I got fired. So is that directly COVID related? It's indirectly COVID related. I think we're going to, I think there's going to be burgeoning litigation that grows out of COVID directly or indirectly. Okay. Hello, Chief Judge Paul Meyer. Thank you so much for speaking with us today. Uh, it's been tremendously fascinating to listening to your 
remarks. Um, I was curious to the extent that judges that you and your colleagues are able to guide civil litigants in the pursuit of discovery uh, and their motion practice. Um, have you, or have you seen in this, in, in your colleagues, uh, developed a preference for resolving issues more as a matter of law and on issues of law than in engaging in findings of fact? Um, and if so, do you think that's something that will carry over if remote practice um, develops into a norm after the pandemic? Well, I, I guess I think that whether the if remote practice to, you know becomes a norm is probably a when. And again, I for reasons I already mentioned, I have very mixed feelings about it. I, I can I can totally see the, the advantages, but I I th think there are real losses that are so maybe a little bit more intangible and and will be measurable by social scientists at some point, but but not quite yet. Um, do I think we'll be deciding more questions on the law rather than facts? You know, that's hard to know. I Discovery disputes, we get all the time. We get them all the time. And the easiest and best way in my mind to resolve a discovery dispute is to have the parties in the courtroom and just hammer it out. And that's the way I've always done it for years and years as a judge and it's very effective and it's actually the least expensive because filing briefs on discovery disputes is just, in my mind, money down the drain. It's just a huge loss to the clients. So to my mind, the best way to handle those disputes is in court with the lawyers there, walk through those discovery requests, figure out what the objections are, sustain some, overrule others. Obviously that's not happening now. We're not having people in court just to discuss a discovery dispute. I'm trying to do a little bit more of it on paper and maybe that's the situation in which I'm looking more at law rather than facts. I'm also doing things by telephone in a situation like that. And it's it's clunky, you know, they're talking over each other. I don't necessarily always catch everything, but it works. And I do some discovery disputes by video conference. And I know the magistrate judges who are handling a lot of these are doing the same thing. Uh, another real tricky one is a settlement conference where you, in settlement conferences very often we'll begin by talking to everybody and then we'll break up the teams. We'll say, okay, the plaintiff and his lawyers, you go in this room and the defendant and their lawyer go in this room and we kind of do shuttle diplomacy. And doing that on a video means setting up a couple of different rooms and chats and so forth and it's complicated. And you know, all of us have heard things happen on your video and people that are, you know, we heard about the Jeffrey Tooman story and doing too many things at once. I mean, things go wrong. Just as, you know, when, when, when uh, email was new, I'm old enough to remember this. When email was new, I remember wondering whether there's a way to get reply all taken off my computer because I was so terrified that I would say something snarky and it would go to everybody in the building. And, and things, bad things happen, you make mistakes. Um, but it, you know, we can kind of work our way through it and even a discovery dispute can, can be managed on a screen. Um, great, I think we have time for one more question uh, and has a question. Thanks, Professor, sir, and uh, thank you, Your Honor, for joining us. Um, as a law student, I feel some obligation to ask a clerkship-related question. Okay. So uh, a bunch of my classmates and I went through the plan this past year or this past summer and conducted interviews you know, from our bedrooms wearing a suit and gym shorts. Um, there are lots of pros to that, right? Flying all over the country for clerkship interviews over the course of two weeks is extraordinarily expensive and has uh, sort of distributional effects on who can interview for certain positions. But at the same time, you know, spending an hour with someone over Zoom is not the same thing, particularly when you're gonna spend a year with that person mm -hmm. working, you know, mm -hmm. shoulder to shoulder on matters of importance. So what do you think about uh, how, how do we figure out how to take the lessons from, you know, needing to do remote clerkship interviews and trying to you know, use it as a, an interim interview stage, you know, to, to screen people and then invite people for a full round of interviews if it works to try to expand the applicant pool a little bit. Um, you know, what, I guess, what was your experience like? And, and generally, how do we think about clerkship hiring in circumstances like this? You know, this is this is really a, a big challenge for me. I've talked to Professor Mazur about this, as, about this before. Um, I actually think that the, the 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 practice of interviewing on a screen, at least for me in this last year, worked pretty well. What I what I wasn't so happy about is under the new program. And by the way, I'm I'm I, I 
adhere to the Oscar process or the, you know, the judicial conference process religiously, religiously. Um, but one of the problems that this year's program had is that you could make in offers almost like the same day you did interviews. So within a week, all these people had been hired. And I just, I feel like, my gosh, it's so, it's just so rapid. And, you know, I, no, you know, really no time to do what, you know, the kind of thing that you're suggesting, which would be maybe talk to somebody twice, maybe spend a little bit more time, time talking to references and the like. You know, the other the other thing I got to tell you is I, I do. You are right that the, that that eliminating that requirement of spending an extraordinary amount of money to fly around the around the nation to interview with with judges for law students. That was just completely unfair. It just completely unfair. It, and it, it, it privileges people who can afford to do it and really disadvantages people who cannot afford to jump on an airplane and, and fly from, you know, maybe from Boston to, to San Francisco. Um, I myself was slightly, it wasn't, it was, I was slightly less disadvantaged. I mean, I, I had the, I had the benefit of being in Chicago, Illinois, because in the last several years, I've had the great good fortune to hire Chicago clerks and they're just smart and fab, fabulous and great writers and they're just the best. And so it was never a problem for me because if I wanted, you know, somebody from your law school to come downtown, it would take them 15 minutes in a cab and, you know, I could even sometimes provide parking. I mean, it's, it was fine for me, but I think particularly if you are in, let's say Nebraska and you'd like a terrific clerk and the clerks are perfectly willing to spend a year in Omaha or wherever it might be, but getting there is a nuisance and difficulty. Then we've, we've kind of solved that problem to some degree with the, with the hiring process. I, I think what, um, yeah, you know, there's, there's no perfect solution. What, what you probably are, are aware of is over time, the, the, the hiring plans were often abused. And I have to admit that often they were abused by the judges. And this bothered me greatly because I think we were, we were telling lawyers, we were telling young lawyers, law students, um, yeah, sub silentio that judges don't play by the rules. And I just, that, that offends me personally. And I don't think it's a good image for us to present to young lawyers who we hope will become the kind of decent human beings that, that we, that we need in our, in our profession. Um, but I think that in general, we're inching toward a better situation because of the possibility of video conferencing and because, um, it, because of the way that, that levels things. And because I'm, at least I'm hopeful that the judges will be willing to, you know, stick with the program and not do this crazy hiring of, you know, first year law students before they've even taken a class. And with that, I'm very sorry to say that we are out of time. So please join me in thanking Chief Judge Rebecca Pallmeyer. Well, thank you. It, it, it's always an honor to be invited to the law school. And, you know, I'm very proud of, of having a degree from this institution and wish all of you young lawyers well. I'm, I'm looking forward to having you in court. It, this will be over someday. We'll get a vaccine. I mean, it's, we're not going to turn the light switch on and have everything go back to back to normal. But we will we will accomplish this mission. We will get back to business as usual. And I'm looking forward to seeing all of you then. Great. Thank you so much. Judge thank Palmer. you. Thank you, Judge Pallmeyer, and thank you, Professor Mazur. Um, I want to be aware of everyone's time, but give everyone a moment to take a break before our final panel. So we will come back in just three minutes at 12.08 and, or 208 and get started with panel three, which is reactions and adaptations to pandemics in the law, past, present, and future. 